Thank you for watching the message today. We hope it blesses you. Your support of the ministry means so much to us. And we encourage you to share this video with your family and friends because it's an easy and simple way to share the gospel. If you'd like to support CWC financially, you can go to cwccs.org forward slash give. You can give on our CWC app or click the link in the bio if you're on YouTube. Now let's get into the message. God bless. Heavenly Father, Lord, we raise a hallelujah in confidence of our King, of our Savior. Father, we are in full confidence, God, that you overcame death overcame sin, God, for our sake. God, you didn't need to do it. But Father, you loved us enough to the point of sending your own son. God, in order that we would ba be back into communion with you, Father, your original intent for creating us. So God, we thank you, we praise you, Father. We raise this in full confidence, that God, that we will see a victory according to your will. Father, thank you. God, in the simplicity of our hearts, thank you. We praise you for you are good. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He is so good. Thank you, worship team. We are so blessed each and every weekend to have an amazing church, an amazing congregation, and another amazing bald guy. <laughs> Uh, there's only a couple of us, so I can give them a hard time. But uh, yeah, well, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. If this is your first time visiting our church again, we're so blessed to have you here uh, with us. And welcome to our online community as well. Let's give a big clap to all those watching online. Thank you for joining us this weekend. Well, there's a couple people that I need to, to thank and acknowledge. Uh, first and foremost, Jesus, man, would we be here without him? So let's give... Jesus, his honor and his due. Secondly, our, our senior pastor, Pastor Al, man, such an amazing man of God who continually serves uh, where God has placed him here at this congregation. We love Pastor Al. We hope that they're having a great time, but I'm just so honored that he asked. Yes. So honored. Myself, Pastor Mark, and Pastor Nathan are extremely honored when he asked us to teach this series. And the third person I have to thank is my wife. She's amazing. I definitely married up. She's been so gracious and encouraging uh, to me. Yes, amazing. My wife is awesome. And so, again, and my family who's watching, too, uh, they have always been a big part of my life. Well, we are continuing this morning our series on exposing the enemy. We've been in two weeks of this. We're in our third week, and we're basing our teaching, uh, our understanding from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. But before we actually read that text, I wanted to tell you uh, about a story, about a story, a, a short story of two young six-year-olds. So if you can just, for a second, uh, imagine, go back, maybe for some of you it's a long time back, or maybe some of you it's a recent time back, go, but go back to when you were six years old, and you can imagine just as these two were, and two six-year-olds struggled with the problem of the existence of the devil. One boy said, Oh, there isn't any devil. The other, rather upset, said, as you can imagine, imagine being six, and when someone says something upset, man, you get opinionated, right? As a six-year-old, the other one said, what do you mean there isn't any devil? It talks about him all the way through the Bible. The first six-year-old replied, said, ah, oh, that's not true. You know, it's just like Santa Claus. The devil turns out to be your dad. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> but as we're about to see, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says something different about the devil. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You see, that's the truth in the reality of who our enemy is, and that's why we felt... Pastor Mark, Pastor Nathan, and myself, that it was important as we were looking, as we were reading through Warren Wiersbe's study of the, of the uh, exposing the enemy, that we felt it was essential that we do a study upon who he is. And we hope and we pray as this series continues 
as we expose the enemy, that all of us will be aware of how Satan is looking to attack you. You see, we can no longer live as the first six-year-old addressed that Satan doesn't exist. We can't live that way. We must realize that he is crafty and deceiving. One of my favorite preachers of all time, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he said this, Satan may be cunning now. I may truthfully say, more cunning than the days of Adam. For he has had a long dealings with the human race. Satan's been dealing with us, the human race, for a very long time. Just to give you a short review of where we have been over the past couple weeks. Well, week one, Pastor Mark shared Satan's attack on the mind. And he used the specific example of Adam and Eve. He shared with us that Satan used lies and deception to make them ignorant of God's will. He shared that Satan uses the same method with us. You see, but the great news about this series that we're doing together is we don't just end our sermon right there. We're realizing within the text that we have a defense. And Pastor Mark shared with us what our defense was. And it's the inspired Word of God. And that you and I, we must memorize it, meditate on it, and use the Word of God daily. And then week two, Pastor Nathan shared that Satan's attack on the body. And he used the specific example of Job. He shared with us that Satan used deception to make Job doubt God's care and control. He shared that Satan uses the same method with us. Yet again, we have a defense. And here it is. To know that God cares for us. And that He is in control. So now we are rolling into week three. This morning we are going to expose Satan's attack on the will of God. We're going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1-17. through Whether you're here or you're online, if you would, open up your Bible, and hopefully you're already there as Pastor Nathan gave you where we're going to be at. And we're going to read through this text together. But before we actually read, I want to let you know where we land in 1 Chronicles. There's a lot of history behind 1 Chronicles, but I want to let you know that we find ourselves within this text during the time of David's reign as the leader of Israel. So now you know where we are, and and we have to understand too something. I don't know if you know this, but I want to let you know that we believe here at Calvary Worship Center that this is the actual Word of God, that the part of the Bible is actually history. And we're smack dab in our text in the middle of the history of Israel. And so we wanted to make sure you guys know that this story isn't made up. It's actually something that occurred and happened. And it's really important that we all understand it this morning. So if you would, join with me as we read 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1-17. through 17. It begins by saying, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring me word that I may know their number. Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. But my Lord the King, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab gave the number of the census of all the people to David, In all Israel were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And Judah was 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not number Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. 
the Lord spoke to Gad and David said, saying, Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemy overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not lead me, do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. Seventy thousand men of Israel fell, and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity and said to the destroying angel, It is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven with his drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders covered with sackcloth fell on their faces and David said to God, it is, is it not I who commanded the count, the people? Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done, O Lord my God? Please let your hand be against me and my father's household, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. I love this story. This is an accurate story that happened. And this is where we find ourselves. This is our text. But I want to let you know in chapter 17, something important happened between David and God. You see, in chapter 17, God makes a covenant with David. God begins chapter 17 by reminding David of their history. From the beginning of David's life as a shepherd, God had always delivered his enemies. Also, what's extremely important about chapter 17 is that God promises that the coming Messiah would come from David's lineage. Look with me at, at 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 14. It will be on the screen. and says, And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. You see, what's also great about chapter 17 is David has the accurate response to hearing all these great things that God is doing. And again, I want to reread chapter 17, verse 14, and then look at David's response. It says this, And I will establish in him my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. David responds with, And now, Lord, you are God. You have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless this house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. It's a great, amazing thing that is going on, that God's making this covenant with David. And then David responds accurately in thanksgiving and praise and prayer. And then from chapter 18 to chapter 20, God is a man of his word. I'm going to take a second just to pause there right now just to encourage you. If you're sitting here or watching online, let me tell you something. God is a man of his word. God is a man of his word. If you didn't know that this morning, let me reassure you that what God has said will come to fruition. What he is, amen, give him glory. If you're online, you can do the clap hands. Give him glory, for he is good. All the things that God promised in the Old Testament came true. He was a, he's a man of his word. And from chapter 18 through chapter 20, God is a man of his word. He begins to bring victory and strength to David's kingdom. And now we find ourselves in chapter 21. And in chapter 21, things begin to change. Something happens. 
in chapter 21, we see Satan's specific target, and it's David. If you'll go back to chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. This is where Satan makes his stand. You see, in this text, we have this word stand. In the Hebrew word, it means amad. And what this means is to arise, to appear, come on the scene, stand forth, appear, rise up or against. You see, Satan saw all the good that God was doing. He said, "Mm -mm -mm. i got to stand up against Israel. I see all the good that you're doing, God. And what does he do? It says it, and move David to number Israel. Now he moved David. This Hebrew word is the word soothe. And what it means is to incite, allure, instigate, entice. So all this good was being done. God is a man of his word. And then we roll into chapter 21 and Satan stands up. He comes on the scene and he targets David and he begins to entice, allure David. You see, Satan comes on the scenes and begins to entice David to do something out of the will of God that God has specifically for David and the people of Israel. And just for a second, can you just imagine how Satan did this? And I want to reference something in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1-2. through 2, And it says, Then it happened in the spring at the time when the kings got out of battle that Joab led out the army and ravaged the land of the sons of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem and Joab struck Rabbah and overthrew it. David took the crown of their kingdom from his head and he found it to weigh a talent of gold and there was a precious stone in it and it was placed on David's head. And he brought it out, out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. I can just imagine part of what Satan was doing as he rose David, as he was soothing David. He brought back this memory of this crown that was being placed on his head. And he said, David, David, look how great you are. Look at what you're see, I want you and I just right now to think about all the times in your life that God has been good to you. Think about it. Think about all the times God was just moving mightily, doing great things in your life, fulfilling his word and the promises that he has for you. And Satan showed up on the scene. Look at that crown on your head. Well, how do we know that God does great things in our life? Is it just a made-up thing? Is it something that we can just tell people just to make them think God is good? No, his very word says it in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. No, we need to go, yes, God, thank you. Do you realize that, that the creator of this universe actually has a plan for you? And for you, that he does, that he loves you. And he's like, I want you to have a prosperous life. He wants you to have a prosperous life. He does not want you to live in a disastrous state. He wants to give you a future and a hope. That's what God promised. Think about all the good things God has done in your life. In the midst of that, Satan stands up and begins to entice us. What does he entice us with? What is his weapon? In chapter 21, we see Satan's weapon is pride. Refer back to me to verse 2. It said, So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, Go! Number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring me word that I may know their number. So we all need to ask the question, why would David even need to know their number? 
if God, as we just read in verse 17, promised he would increase the kingdom. Well, why did David need to know the number? It was for his own gain and his own pride. Do you realize that? That that's what it was for. You see, also, when we understand that this is a pride issue, as we reference verses 3 and 4, it says, Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? You see, the reason we know it was pride is because David would not heed the word of others who were speaking truth. You see, folks, ladies and gentlemen, everyone watching online, do you know something? We need Joabs in our life. Don't we? Joabs are people that in the midst of our pride, they speak God's truth. They absolutely do. Let me encourage you something. Keep the Joabs. You know what Joabs are to us? Listen in. The Joabs in our life are God's grace. Think about it for a second. If David would have heeded the words of Joab, there would have been no punishment for his sin. It was God instilling his grace upon the situation. David, listen up. I'm using Joab to speak to you. How many of us have Joabs in our life that when we're prideful, we remove them and go, nah -uh. We need to keep Joabs in our life and understand they're not a, a, a pestilence. They're not to be annoyed with. They're God's grace to keep us from sinning. That's who Joabs are. That's who we see Joab is in this text. You see, Satan knows the pride of man's heart. He knows how big of a weapon pride is. You see, I am fully convinced that pride can tear apart a bunch of things. But first and foremost, did you know that pride can tear apart our relationship with Jesus? Let me give you an instance. Here it is. God, I'm good. Don't you know how great I am? Like, Father, I have all, why would I need Jesus? Like, I, I don't need a Savior. Maybe that's you here in this room or you online. Like, you've been so prideful and going, I don't need, I don't want this Jesus. I don't want this relationship. I'm good. It can tear apart what God intends for you. Secondly, our marriages. Pride can tear apart our marriages. Think about it for a second. Don't you know, Pastor Shea, I'm the perfect spouse? Like, they're lucky to be married to me. Or, Pastor Shea, don't you know, I, I just work all day long, and I just provide for our family and all these things, and I just want to come home and have a wife that just serves me. And if she does it, I'm going to be so mad or the opposite. Pastor Shea, don't you know, I just provide for our family. I just want a husband who just does everything that I ask, and I'm just so angry that I can't submit to what the Lord would have for me as a spouse. You see, pride will rip apart marriages if we don't submit to where the Lord is calling us to submit our pride in our marriages. Do you realize that? You see, pride will also tear apart our relationship with our children. Well, how could that be, Pastor Shea? Let me tell you something. When me and my wife knew that we were having our, our first child, Liam, he's an amazing son. I love him to death. We were like, we have no idea how to be parents. So we're like, you know, I'm going to read this book. And Paul David Tripp writes this great book on parenting. And what we realized that was the importance of when mom and dad messed up, that we would take the time and go seek forgiveness from our children. Why? To show them how forgiveness works. 
to show them that mom and dad can be wrong, but they, they ask for an apology so our kids see that, oh, that, that I can actually forgive mom and dad? That they love me enough to say that they messed up? Yes. But if you think my kids can't, if you're so prideful in parenting that you're not willing to go to your children and say, mom and dad messed up, will you forgive me? We love you and we want you to forgive us. Then you will have the worst relationship with your children. But if children, you're sitting here this morning, you're like, yeah, Pastor Shay, get them. Get those parents. Ha, ha, ha. I haven't forgotten about you, children. You see, pride can rip apart our relationship with our parents. If you as children aren't willing to be so submitted to the working of God that when your parents apologize for their wrongdoing, if you're just so like, I can't forgive you! Don't you know you hurt me? How dare you, mom and dad? Let me tell you something. If you're not willing to forgive your parents for what they have done against you, you're letting your pride raise up within your heart. Children, forgive your parents for their wrongdoing. Also, pride can tear apart our friendships, our jobs, our Christian witness. Why do you ask? Here it is. The reason pride can tear these apart is because all of these things are promises from God to benefit you and I. To glorify him. Think about it. Does our relationship with Jesus glorify God? Absolutely. Does our marriage meant to glorify God? Yes. Is us raising children meant to glorify God? Yes. Is our ability to be kids? Yes. Is our friendships, jobs, Christian witness all meant to glorify our creator? Absolutely. <laughs> Satan wants to tear these apart because of our pride. Here's the thing about David. A lot of us, maybe you were like me, I grew up in Sunday school, we call it children's ministry. We have a phenomenal children's ministry here, by the way. But a lot of times when we hear about David, we automatically think of Bathsheba. And we go, well, that's the greatest sin David ever had. Yet I believe that that was a sin of the flesh. And David's pride was a sin of the spirit. And let me tell you something, no one is greater than the other. Well, how do we even get there, Pastor Shea? How do we even know that? I'm glad that you asked. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 tells us, God's word says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. No one is greater than the other. You see, unfortunately, we can easily disguise our pride. This is why Satan loves to use this weapon. Because we can disguise it. It's not in the flesh. It is of the spirit. You know, having a life of 34 years on this earth, and some of you in this room and watching online have less than that. Some have more. But we all can collectively agree that if we could phrase or use a phrase to describe pride, the best one might just be that pride is a false sense of glory and joy. Again, I'm going to say that again. That collectively, that we think that we can describe pride as a false glory and a false joy thinking that you and I, that we are capable of anything good apart from God. That's what pride is. That you and I, that we could do anything good from, apart from the God is a false sense of glory and joy. And guess what? This is the worst part of all of that. We think we can do good apart from God and then we take credit for it. You know, when I was studying this text and I was like, man, this is huge. But I was like, I'm just viewing this from a male perspective. I'm going, I know men struggle with pride. But I need a female perspective. And I was like, man, I was studying in my office. I was like, 
who could I ask? And I was like, ha ha. I don't know. We have an amazing coffee shop, Numa. Hopefully you all caffeinated in here. And if you're online, hopefully you got coffee at home. We have an, a phenomenal barista named Amy, and she's a, a, an Olympic athlete. And I was like, she's perfect. Someone training to be an Olympian in wrestling. And I was like, hey, Amy, I went to go get over my cold brew with heavy whipping cream. Great drink. And I said, hey, Amy, I got this question for you. I'm, I'm studying about pride, Satan's use of it. I was like, how do you, how do you as, as females, as, as your wrestling team, how do you guys struggle with the idea and thought of pride. You know what, she was, as she was telling me, I was so overjoyed. She was explaining to me the exact same way that men struggle. And I was like, yes! I was like, this is perfect! That, that no matter if you are male or female, thinking that we're able to do anything good apart from God and take credit for it is a false glory and a joy. But we have to understand, why would Satan do this? Well, Satan's why, we're going to see in chapter 21, is to make us, to make David, independent of the will of God. Verse 4 says, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. I want to let you guys know something that's really important. Did you know that you were created to be dependent upon your creator? When God breathed life into man, his original intent for all of us was to be dependent upon God. Did you know that? Did you know that online? That you were absolutely 100% created to be dependent upon your creator? Because here's the thing. How do we even know this? That this is actually a great thing? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 17 says this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? I love this next part. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So love that text. But do you know what Satan wants us to depend on? You see, Satan, he desires for us to depend on ourselves. Satan desires for us to depend on others. Satan depend, he wants us to depend on our own victories. Satan wants us to depend on our own goals, on our own achievements, You see, he wants us to do these things, even though we could say, those are kind of good. He wants us to remove our dependency off of God for this reason. Pride will lead us to get out of the will of the Father. You see, what's important about this story in 1 Chronicles, you see, David was not to depend on his kingdom being great. Yet God wanted David to trust him and believe him. God wanted David to be like the shepherd boy who when facing Goliath knew that God would bring the victory. You see, God wanted David to trust him and believe the great promise of God. God promised he would bring great number to David's kingdom. There was no reason other than David's pride to make account of the people. You know, what I find interesting about this text is that David's punishment for his sin included that which he was so dependent on. Yet David still knew that God would always be more gracious than men. 1 Chronicles 21, 13 through 15. Again, we've already read this, but it's good to go back. And, And David said to Gad, I am in great distress 
Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for His mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying it, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. I love this text that we're in. But here's the thing that I want us to understand. Now that we know our enemy's tactics and that we can be a direct target, what is our defense? It's a great question. But you know what the privilege is of Pastor Nathan, myself, and Pastor Mark, what we've been able to do? Is I want to let you know what we've been able to do, but before we get there, I want you to know I'm a huge, massive, big, not dude, World War II fan. I love World War II. I love the history of it. And one of my favorite parts of World War II was what we used to really, some would say, win the war, and it was the cryptology. You see, if you don't know what cryptology is, don't worry, I'm about to tell you. Cryptology is the study of secret codes. You see, being able to read encoded German and Japanese military and diplomatic communications was vitally important to the victory in World War II, and it actually helped shorten the war considerably. You see, in World War II, wireless radio communications was very important for directing military forces spread all over the world. But, as you can imagine, radio messages could be intercepted. So secret information, plans, and orders had to be transmitted in secret codes. And so all the major powers use these complex machines that turn ordinary text into secret codes. You see, the Allies were actually able to read German messages very early in the war thanks to brilliant work by Polish and British mathematicians. You see, the cryptologists also exploited Japanese codes. By the late 1940, the U.S. Army and Navy could read Japanese diplomatic messages between Tokyo and the embassies in London, Washington, Berlin, and Rome. American experts named the Japanese code PURPLE as they called intelligence from these messages magic. You see, as the war went on, the Allied analysis combined all of this. And in, in contrast, what was so important is that in, in the German and Japanese codes, the American codes provided unbreakable due to the superior code. But here was what was so important, is that as they played an important role in the war in Europe, since Tokyo wanted to, to give the information from its diplomats about German and Italian progress, intercepting these Japanese messages gave Allied commanders vital information about Nazi weapons, production, and German plans to defend Europe from invasion. Allied leaders also knew from magic that Japan would not surrender unconditionally unless forced. You know what we've done for you? We've been your cryptologist. We've ciphered the code. We've told you how Satan operates. But the great news is, we're going to tell you your defense. Here it is. In chapter 21, we see that our defense is the indwelling Spirit of God. Verse 6, let's look at it together. It says, But he did not number Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. You see, in verse 6, we begin to understand that David was beginning to realize that what he was doing was not of the Lord. Because if we look at it, it says, the king's command was abhorrent to Job, and he didn't number Levi and Benjamin because they played an important role in what God gave them to do amongst the people of Israel. And what does David do? Well, finally, in verse 17, David repents. Look at it. It says, David said to God, Is it not I who commanded the count of the people? Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? O Lord my God, please let your hand be against me and my father's household, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. You see, I'm convinced David had a relationship with God. So how do we have the indwelling Spirit of God? Well, I'm going to give you two texts 
that we're going to spend the time in understanding what do we do. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, it will be on the screen. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Philippians chapter 2, 12 through 13 says this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to do work for his good pleasure. See, what's important about these two texts is they have corresponding truths that we must realize are our defense, and without them, we are vulnerable to the schemes and the attacks of the enemy. First and foremost, as we look in Ephesians, that it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is salvation. This is what God does for you. You may be sitting here in this auditorium or online and you don't believe that. You don't believe that God sent Jesus to live amongst the people and then die upon a cross, be beaten and whipped and pierced. And he said these amazing words upon the cross. He said, it is finished. Your sin, my sin, was paid for. And three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, victorious over death for you and for me. But that is where we must begin. Do you have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus? Because let me tell you, there's only one way you can take, or sorry, there's three ways you can take Jesus. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he must be Lord of your life. That's it. And you are saved through the faith in Jesus Christ. He has done the work. You see, this is where we must begin. Do you know this truth? And just like we can't be the six-year-old who pretended that, that there isn't an enemy, that there is no Satan, we also must never pretend that we have an authentic faith in Jesus without first believing that Christ died for you and for me. Sounds like the world, but let me tell you, I think there's way too many people within our church and many churches and watching online that don't have an authentic belief in Jesus. Because Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, Ah, my hearers, how anxious Satan is to secure your destruction. Since rather that you should see the saving light, he takes the trouble to blind your eyes. Do you get what Spurgeon is saying? That this isn't a game that you can pick up at Walmart and play it and then pack it up and say, we're good. No, Satan is out there to blind your eyes from the very fact that Jesus died for you. Satan's goal is to do that so you don't receive this free gift that Jesus offers. Satan is looking to do that. Today, tomorrow, every day of your life, if you're not willing to receive this free gift, Secondly, in verse 10 in Ephesians, it says that we are his workmanship. This is sanctification. This is what God does in you. This is our spiritual growth. Let me ask you this question. I'll calm down a little bit. (laughs) How are you growing spiritually? How are you growing spiritually? If you say, Pastor Shea, Calm down. I have this relationship with Jesus. Let me ask you this question. How are you growing spiritually? You know, each and every week we have announcements, and I know sometimes you guys are like, "Eh, I don't need to pay attention to them. We're really announcing to you there's ways for you to grow spiritually. Life groups, cornerstones. We have ministry groups here, like marriage marriage ministry groups, bold ministry, everlasting young adults, youth ministry. We have our cornerstones class that teaches you essential truths of the word of God, and we have our school of ministry all designated to help you in your spiritual growth. Yet, we come in, we feel like we've made our check mark, and we leave. You see, we can no longer fake it. The world is watching. 
If we are failing to grow in this area, it will absolutely 100% be known. You see, our character and our conduct come from our sanctification that God does within us. I am confident in saying that we don't have any availability not to grow spiritually. But let me tell you something. It's not a glamorous lifestyle. Because you're going to have to go places where God sends you. I'm reminded by this video that I watched of Penn and Teller. If you don't know who they are, they're comedic magicians. And I was watching this video and they, they were saying, hey, we had this great show and after the show we were greeting our guests and this one gentleman waited patiently and we finally went over to him and this gentleman said, hey, you guys had a great show, I really appreciate it, but I want to tell you about Jesus. And Penn and Teller are staunch atheists and they said, we didn't believe a lick of what this guy said, blah, 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 and they go in this big spiel, but they go, you know what, I actually value this gentleman because they came to a conclusion. They said, you know, as Christians, how much do you actually have to hate somebody to not tell them about Jesus? Our spiritual growth is so important because God's doing a work in us that we're willing to go to a Pell and Teller and tell them about what God is doing in our life. Because here's the thing, when we work out our salvation, this is not working towards it, but it's working it out with fear and trembling. You see, our salvation has a beginning full of grace. When you have pride residing in your life, you know what God does? He extends you grace and says, come and receive a freshness of the Spirit. I will forgive you, but I will walk alongside you. And thirdly, we see the good works, what God does in us. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. It says, I therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, in this text, it says this word present, but it's once for eternity that you present this. But you need a daily reminder and asking of the Spirit. And the best way that I can show you an example of this is my daughter has a lot in common with the Holy Spirit. Don't think I'm being weird. I'm just telling you something. If you're a parent, you understand nighttime is glorious because you get to put your kids to sleep for a short period of time and you and your wife or your, your spouse can just imagine for a second, oh, this is what life is like without children. <laughs> but my daughter has a great reminder. Just she's active in reminding us at 6 a.m., you're a parent, <laughs> right? She's, she's letting us know and, and look, You have to be reminded from the Holy Spirit that you have access to continually present your bodies. You see, in this text, we see the words body, mind, and will. What we've been teaching on for the past three weeks. It seems that our Savior knows our enemy as well. Satan will make our bodies impatient to God's control and care. Satan will use lies and deception to make us ignorant of God's will. And Satan will use pride to make us independent of God's will. You see, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, there's this word prove. And in the Greek, it, it's dokemizo. And it means to recognize as genuine after examination, to approve, deem worthy. Yet, this is what's so important. Our defense is the indwelling Spirit of God that first and foremost leads us to salvation. Secondly is our sanctification, our spiritual growth. And through those two things, we produce good works of God. Through the overflowing presence of the Holy Spirit, And what happens when our lives are set on salvation and sanctification and God does all these good works by the overflowing of his spirit is that God deems our life worthy and the world will see us as genuine people who have a relationship with Jesus. So as the worship team comes up, I have some questions for you. Actually, one question. In three parts. How can you 
receive the indwelling Spirit of God this morning. Maybe you're in this room or you're watching online and you're standing there and you're sitting there and you're saying, Pastor Shea, I realize that God has done great things in my life, but I have had so much pride in my heart that I've said, I don't need you. But I realize today that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And the first thing that you must do is come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and understand he will immediately forgive you just as he did to the thief on the cross and say, today you will be with me in paradise. Maybe you need to accept Jesus this morning. You'll have an opportunity to do that. But maybe you're in here in this room and you're watching online and you already have a relationship with Jesus and you need the sanctification. You need the spiritual growth. You need God to work through you, all he does in you. Come and receive a fresh anointing of the Spirit. Maybe you're in this room and you have that relationship with Jesus and you're watching online and you have that relationship with Jesus and you're growing spiritually, but your, your knowledge of Jesus and your knowledge of spiritual growth has led you to really hate the world. And you need the Spirit to come in you and say, Jesus, I just want to be like that guy that was willing to go to the person who's the staunch atheist and share the gospel because I want the world to see you through me. But Lord, I have so much hatred in my heart that I need a fresh overflow of your spirit and I need to be prayed for. I need anointing. We're going to give you that opportunity as well. So would you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done this morning. God, this is not of me. This is of you. These, these are your people. God, you have spoken truth. God, you have moved through the worship time and moved through the word time. Father, your Holy Spirit has come and spoke truth to us in our hearts. And God, I pray for those right now that are in this auditorium or watching online and they're sitting there and they're saying, you know what, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I have to take Jesus one way and right now I'm taking him as a liar or maybe a lunatic, but I want to make him Lord of my life. And if that's you right now in this auditorium or watching online, I, if you're in this auditorium, I just want you to raise your hand up high so I can pray for you. And if you're watching online, I want you to click the button to let us know that you're making this decision. So if you're in here and you want to make a decision for Jesus today, raise your hand up high. I see you in the back. Keep your hand up. Amen. See you in the front. Amen. We see you online. There's two online as well. Don't miss out on what God wants to do in your life today. Raise your hand up high if you're willing to make that decision for Jesus. And maybe, thank you for those who raised your hand. And I want you to pray this prayer with me, whether you're online or in this. I want you, where you're at, I simply just want you to pray this. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. But after hearing today's message, I realize that you died for me. And then I want to ask you to come and live inside of my heart and be the Lord of my life. God, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying for me. Lead me, direct me, guide me. In your name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for watching and supporting the ministry today. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and like the video. If you want to watch the sermons live, we live stream every Sunday at 10 a.m. on our app and website at cwccs.org. Have a blessed rest of your day. God bless.